Okay, so here's the deal. <clears throat> The whole renting of homes thing is going to be going through a very unique situation. Now, the bottom line is this. We have, uh, and for the past 15 years, had a significant amount of people who basically were younger but needed housing because they just, for whatever reason, were disabled, they were homeless, et cetera, and they needed a place to stay. The majority were a lot of new young people, but they would obviously preference young women who had children or elderly individuals. And for the most part, there weren't enough places for them to live, but they would work it out, make it happen, and then they would wiggle it through. That's not going to happen in the future because in the future, the amount of boomers that are going to be having a difficult time financially is going to skyrocket massively. Let me explain why. As you know, there is a problem with the retirement trust fund. The retirement trust fund, 2033, 2034, mostly 2033, or potentially even earlier, is going to run out, which means that they can only rely on what people pay in each and every year to then pay back for those retirement benefits for the next year. As a result of this problem, you're going to be seeing a significant amount of retired individuals who have to sell their house and who also have to find cheaper rental accommodations. When that happens, and this is the most important thing you can realize with this, when that happens, you're going to be seeing a significant amount of elderly entering into the public housing assistance market. Because when they're not getting their full 100% retirement check, and they're only getting like 75% of that check, they're not going to be able to go and successfully rent the places that they need to. The only safe ones are those who are going to sell their home to some giant company like Zillow or whatever. Super thank you for the two dollar donation, not guilty. Very, very cool. Uh, do you not do you ever sleep? Uh, sometimes, sometimes, but not always. It's been super tough with sweetie. It's it's been very tough because I have to lift her up a zillion times throughout the day and she's 90 pounds. Now, with that said, I am noticing that housing groups that are basically being set up where they buy a motel. They buy a, an old hotel, they fix it up, they're putting essentially some sort of elderly care individual in it to manage it, and then they basically rent out all of these rooms to elderly individuals or disabled who don't have money for something that's more expensive. This is designed usually off of the same blueprint as what's called the dual diagnosis living accommod uh, accommodations. All right, so what are the dual diagnosis situations? That's where an individual is both you know, likely disabled and also has some sort of drug or alcohol-related problem. And so there's certain conditions to be able to live in that facility. Now, a lot of you guys know when you go into like elderly living, if it's available, if they have enough spaces, if they have enough rooms, there's always these provisions. And a lot of younger people, especially those who are disabled, they don't realize that these facilities have so many restrictions. So what I want to talk about today is what it's going to be like renting basically a room through the public housing situation for the disabled, for the disabled veterans, although they get a lot more money, or pot potentially the elderly in the future. <clears throat> now, the future of human housing is starting to become more clear based on what other countries uh, are doing. You know, sleeping tubes. That's where you have a ton of tubes that people go into. They sleep in the tube and then they have a shared general area. That way they can keep their rental costs low. Uh, they have extreme density mini cities where people, you know, you can live ultra cheaply. A lot of the businesses in there are not using, uh, are not, you know, held to certain standards. So they can sell things even cheaper than before. They can produce things and sell them without all that government interference. So, you know, and then a lot of these new places that are being put up are being designed with almost prison-like architecture used for low-income housing, among many, many other things. But the, the point is this, the, the freedom that people who are elderly or disabled are, are accustomed to is going to be slightly changing. And we're going to talk about those right now. Please remember to like, and please remember to subscribe as we talk about these difficult topics. Now, remember, getting old, and paying for housing will become a quasi-luxury for most due to the impending retirement crisis. So while I make this video, I realize some will say, oh, you know, he's, he's fear-mongering or he's giving us fear, blah, blah, blah. Look, here's the deal. I haven't been wrong yet about the CDI investigators, uh, which you all said was fear-mongering. Didn't turn out to be that. Turned out to be worse than I even said it was. The reduction of disability benefit uh, passage rates 
Told you about that. Now people are on board with that. The modifying of the appeal rules, which uh, happened in 2017, our commissioner saw. And the political standstill on Social Security benefits. And just to be fair, Obama didn't fix it. Trump didn't fix it. Biden didn't fix it. All sinners, no saints. Okay. So to be fair, you just have to think about these things. Most of the following are just common sense, and most of the following are already in action in places like Asia and European countries. <clears throat> now, the first thing that you're probably going to be seeing is limited water use. What do I mean by that? You're going to have so many gallons per day that you can actually access through your living you know, area. So you know, you'll know that you'll have enough for a shower, you'll know that you'll have enough to brush your teeth, you'll know that you'll have enough to drink, but beyond that, They'll be reducing it so that you can't go ahead and fill up additional water bottles to potentially sell water in the future because water is likely to become at least that's, you know, sterilized water, drinkable water, potable water, whatever is likely to become more and more expensive in the future to the point where people will actually bottle it and then try to sell it. Next thing, limited clothing wash cycles. So as these machines become more efficient, we're getting more so away from that 220 plug in, you know, your 30 amp gig and all that jazz. And basically it's going more to just 110, you know, the, the washer dryer machines and one are becoming more popular, etc. But the problem is electrical usage with a significant increase in humans becomes a problem, especially when a lot of these cars are charging off the electric grid. So you'll probably see that living facility trying to significantly reduce how much clothing you're actually washing. And people will start to be wa you know, wearing clothing for clothing for two days or potentially three days and then washing, to base, washing it based off of essentially power grid limitations or power consumption that's going into that building. The next one, kilowatt power consumption restrictions that are measurable that you can see on the wall inside your apartment. So a lot of people uh, don't think about you know power consumption right now because where they live they might not it, they might not charge them extra et cetera and you've all seen the shift like you saw the shift from if you rent this place this is how much you know cost in total that includes power water trash whatever blah 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 includes all the utilities this is the amount now it's not like that now the way it works is this is the rent and then you pay this and this and this. And for whatever you use for your utilities on top of that. And that's because the utilities just became more and more and more ridiculously expensive. And so as a result of that, a lot of these, you know, trailer homes or trailer parks or uh, elderly living facilities or disabled uh, living facility communities, they all started to charge them based off of essentially their utility usage. You know, some of them, okay, your rent is 25% of your disability check, but you got to pay this much in utilities on top of that as to whatever your utilities come down to, which when you think about it is a big expense because they have to install all of those like, you know, power measuring units, but th they do it because at the end of the day, they're just losing too much money. It's costing too much. Um, and, and, the, and the dollar is decreasing so much and the value of these resources like power is just going up. We're just not in a good spot. So with that said, next one limited exits and entries with door lockout functions with one time extra per week exception allowances. So basically your ability to leave the facility and come back from the facility. So a lot of places for the disabled and elderly already have restrictions where you have to be in by this time, you can leave this early, things like that. But what they haven't gotten to yet usually is how many times you can actually leave per day and then you know basically come back. And I think that in all reality is on the next step of this HOA control <clears throat> of your ability to use the, 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 the facility that you have. Next one, limited additional people staying with you. A lot of parents have their homeless kids pop in and stay with them. Um, I think these facilities are going to become more aggressive in limiting that because of the utility consumption usage. And so what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of these parents, they've got kids or the kids have kids and they're staying with them and they're staying with them under the radar. A lot of these 55 plus communities, they want to allow you to have this or that or et cetera. And as, as, a, as a reason of that, the unfortunate thing is that basically, you know, at the end of the day, they do not want you having more people wearing down specifically the facility. 
And it's not, it's not good. And the reason it's not good is because unfortunately at the end of the day, uh, utilities are very expensive. Somebody walking up and down that carpet multiple times is going to wear out the carpet more quickly. People using the beds and the mattresses, we're going to wear them out more quickly, et cetera. And then at the end of the day, unfortunately, where you get to it, you get to this point where the facility is just getting used up faster. You know, think of it this way. Let's say you had a, an apartment. Apartment's got carpet, right? They have two dogs. They got, you know, uh, two kids. They got two adults, right? Now you increase that to uh, four kids, six kids, uh, two adults plus their Uncle Eddie, whatever. And all of a sudden that carpet's going to get worn out significantly faster, which means that the housing group or the owner is going to have to replace that carpet, which is of course getting more and more expensive. You know, carpet per room used to be like 200, 300 bucks. Now carpet per room is like a thousand bucks plus. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Next one. Uh, okay. So next one, no pet usage likely, even if you have a medical letter being that you are pushed to keep the room or the pet. So one of the things I'm noticing with the living uh, arrangements for a lot of individuals is that they're now getting faced with this new situation where like, you know, the county will say, okay, well, they're allowed to have their pet. And they'll go ahead and then the facility will say, okay, well, we can't allow you to have the pet because of this thing or this thing or this thing. So you have to choose. And then there's this whole legal battle that ensues if they can find an attorney to actually make it happen. So Along with this idea is that the poor are going to have a harder time finding attorneys to actually represent them in the future because there's just not enough money to be made off the claim. And I know a lot of people will be like, oh, well, the attorneys are just being greedy. Well, the attorneys like to eat too. And to be fair, I've been working with the homeless and the low income longer than most attorneys that actually practice all their entire life. So to be fair, it sucks being poor. It just sucks always being poor. Now, I've slowly increased and increased and increased. But, you know, at the same time, when COVID hit, I, mean, I almost went bankrupt twice during that period. So and that was purely due to having way too many SSI claimants, which means way too low a payout for the amount of work that has to go into the claim to actually try and win it. So to be fair, working for the homeless, working for the low income, you do very poor, very poor when it comes to uh, not only being able to pay yourself, but being able to pay your employees. And then, of course, the big thing that got me yelled at is at the end of the year, the bonuses. Let me tell you. Those are important to the employees. Next one. Neighbors who will snitch on people because they have a system of good behavior with benefit allowances. So I foresee potentially in the future that, um, you know, there's essentially going to be some sort of system where people will increase, uh, whatchamacallit, likely, uh, you know, the chances that if somebody corrects the behavior of the overall culture of the community, that they'll go ahead and say, okay, well, look, if we, you know, go ahead and have Cindy tell us about Sarah doing something wrong, then we should give Cindy some benefit and it will create this like, you know, snitching culture. And that's not good, but I can foresee that being integrated into a system like this because then all of a sudden, you know, these people are vying to have some sort of managerial status or lead role status and uh, they get some sort of additional benefit as a result of that. Next thing is limited movement without medical containment attire, such as gloves and masks. Now, as you know, a lot of medical facilities uh, prior to COVID, you know, you could go in and out, you know, it was more loosey goosey, et cetera. Now, obviously medical equipment is used for the protection specifically with people who are in the 85 and older category, because if you're 85 and older, your likelihood of getting COVID and then passing away from it, way higher, way higher, right? So the bottom line is you're going to be seeing a lot of these actual public housing facilities require of you consistently to come in, go, you know, to come into the facility and leave the facility using medical durable equipment. If you're not, uh, they'll go ahead and cite you, give you crap, put you, you know, on some list, et cetera. Now, another thing that I want to keep in mind too, is that a lot of these facilities used to have what's called uh, transportation options or some white van that would take you from this point to this point to get groceries, whatever. I'm noticing that a lot of facilities are pulling back from essentially having some sort of transportation for their elderly and disabled uh, claimants. And the reason why <clears throat> is that, you know, it's cheaper to basically give them a bus pass than it is to upkeep a van and then pay for the fuel and do all that stuff and then have a driver. So you'll likely be seeing that a lot of these facilities are cutting back on that and that essentially, you know, the, the future of buying your groceries online and having them be delivered so that the elderly disabled person never really gets to get out, you know, never gets to leave, that's going to be on the rise as well. All right. These are things that you can hold me to that I believe will be happening in the future when it comes to a lot of these elderly and disabled facilities. Please remember to like. Please remember to subscribe. 
I will catch you a little bit later. I hope all is well. Uh, and uh, bottom line is uh, we are going to go do the live next. You, know, you guys know every Thursday we go live on YouTube, uh, you know, somewhere around eight ish, nine ish. Unfortunately, this one's going to be around 11 ish. Uh, and then basically you get five to seven minutes per call. Use a fake name throughout it. Uh, have your legal question ready. No story mode. All right. I will see you guys at the next video where we do the live consultation and uh, give me about four minutes. We'll get it set up and we'll get rolling. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. I'll catch you in about four minutes. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.